Coming up on DTNS, a fintech trend to watch for unbanked people, why NVIDIA is disabling its own video cards a little bit, and why Facebook is blocking all the news in Australia. There's no more news. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, February 18th, 2021. Can you hear us, Australia? In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just uh, talking about refrigerators quite a bit on Good Day Internet. How many? they? Amos has a lot of refrigerators. Uh, if you want to know why, get Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple TV's app is now available on Chromecast with Google TV. First announced back in December, Google also announced the Apple TV app will come soon to 2021 Sony and TCL Google TV-powered TVs. Apple has offered an Android TV version of the Apple TV app since October, but it was limited to just certain Android TV powered Sony TVs. Newly unsealed documents in the 2018 class action lawsuit against Facebook's ad practices show that Facebook's COO, Sheryl Sandberg, acknowledged in 2017 that, quote, potential reach metrics shown to advertisers included false and duplicate accounts. In 2018, documents show Facebook estimated removing these would reduce potential reach by 10% and have a significant impact on company revenue. Google announced new Chromebook features today. A built-in screen reader arrives in March. The company also promised 40 new devices that include convertibles, touchscreens, stylus support, dual cameras, LTE connectivity. They didn't give too many specifics beyond that, though. Google also added new accessibility features to its Chrome Vox screen, screen reader, like improved tutorials, ability to search Chrome Vox menus, and smooth voice switching. And parents can now add their children's school accounts to their personal accounts managed with Family Link. Microsoft's head of Windows servicing and delivery, John Cable, posted about some of the features coming to the next major update to Windows 10, version 21H1. The spring update usually has the bigger features, but they're flipping it this year. 21H1 is going to be focused on remote work features. Windows Hello will support an external camera now by default. Uh, Windows Defender application guard is going to get faster at opening documents. Performance improvements are coming for remote work, as well as to Windows management instrumentation and group policy service. 21H1 started beta testing Thursday. The larger update this year will come in the autumn Windows update. Back to Google News. The company released first developer preview for Android 12 right on schedule. Developer previews this early don't have a lot of consumer-facing updates, however. This release includes support for the AV1 image file format, the ability to transcode media into higher quality formats, faster and more responsive notifications, and the ability for developers to toggle individual changes easily for testing compatibility. Android 12 runs on Pixel devices from 3 on up and the Android emulator. All right, let's talk a little bit about what NVIDIA is doing to their video cards. Justin, what is it? Oh, they are uh, differentiating their markets. Tom, drivers for the forthcoming NVIDIA RTX 3060 video card will detect cryptocurrency mining and reduce the hash rate by about 50%. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA says the 3060 cards are meant for gamers, but NVIDIA would also like to sell cards to Ethereum miners, so it's offering new cryptocurrency mining processors, or CMPs, that don't do video at all. Because they don't have display inputs, the CMPs have greater airflow. They also have lower peak core voltage and frequency to help keep power costs down for miners. The 30HX, which does 26 mega hashes per second, and the 40HX at 36 mega hashes per second are available this quarter from vendors. The more powerful 50 and 9 or 50X and 90HX are coming next quarter. The RTX 3060 arrives February 25th. So uh, this is one of those things where people can decide, oh, this is the best for everybody, right? The the crypto miners get a chip that's made just for them and is power efficient. And that means they don't have to go buy the 3060, which means the gamers have a better chance of getting a hold of one. And everyone's happy, right? Yeah, Tom, everybody's happy. <laughs> this is brand di 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 differentiation that leads to a happier world. Why aren't you smiling, Tom? Smile! <laughs> I pulled some folks about this. Like I, I said, listen, on the surface, 
if you, you know, want, want to use a, you know, a particular chip for mining versus, you know, the gamers who have been, I mean, we talk about it all the time on the show where it's like chip shortages. There are a lot of people, you know, looking for a particular GPU that's like astronomically priced or not available at all. That's been going on for some time and it doesn't seem like things are going to let up anytime soon. Yes. Doesn't this help kind of funnel the traffic into the appropriate places? But, and Tom, I know you kind of agree with me on this is a lot of, a lot of people I know who care about these sort of things are like, but let me make that choice. Mm -hmm. I want something that's powerful and I'm willing to pay for it. And I don't want someone to turn off a feature that, you know, what, what's it to them if I paid for it and I may or may not use it. Yeah. I, 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 I will take the principled stand of, I don't like it when companies, uh, disable things in their own products artificially like this. Uh, if the NVIDIA RTX 3060 can can hash Ethereum at a certain rate, let it hash it at that rate. Uh, don't use a driver to kind of, you know, cut off the legs of it. Providing the CMPs, I think, should be all you need to do. I, I understand that it's not a perfect world and it probably wouldn't, but providing the CMPs would be a way to say, like, look, Ethereum miners, you don't want to buy the 3060. It's inefficient. It's going to eat up too much power. It's too costly. Buy these CMPs. They're great. They're meant for you. I know that means that doesn't mean that everybody will do that. And what NVIDIA is trying to do is push them even farther. It just rubs me the wrong way. I, I'm actually with you. The more I've sat with this, the more I tend to agree with your point that this is them trying to force this issue more than they have to. And, and now it is coming at the cost of user end user utility, that these are not inexpensive processors. You should be able to do everything that the horsepower allows you to do with it. And, and you, you know, it's a, it's a free country. You should be able to spend your money and, and do it, uh, do with it what you will. That being said, I can understand in you know whatever boardroom in which, in which this decision is being made when they see that the pain point is we have overlapping markets and we could have two separate, totally separate, different vectors. We want to split this trail as harshly as we can. I get the decision. However, I think that, that Tom, I, I tend to agree with you. You didn't have to take an anti-user move to do it. It's, it's because there's a chip shortage. It's because NVIDIA is taking so much heat for gamers not being able to get orders, uh, gamers only feeling like their only option is to overpay for some shyster who was able to get an order and is now reselling it as, at a higher price. They're, they're, they're trying to do something that shows they're helping that segment of their market. I get the impulse to do it. It's, it's the 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 scarcity in the market that's driving them to do that. I, I just still don't like it. Well, cause it's too cute, right? It, 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 it's, it's, it's them trying to make sure that this happens, or at least they can say, well, we did everything we could. We even put this restriction on, on the gaming thing. <laughs> Well, there are 1.7 billion underbanked people in the world, a lot of people, who don't benefit from an online-only neobank. That's a bank that just has no physical place for you to go, neobanks, but also don't qualify for commercial loans like microfinancing. And startups are using algorithms to provide instant credit to those who can't get it elsewhere. This is a trend. It's worth watching. For example, Nigeria's Fair Money was started in 2017 to provide instant loans and bill payments for underbanked customers. In 2020, it dispersed $93 million in loans, which is up 128% from the previous year. It has 1.3 million unique users who can borrow between $3.30 all the way up to $1,110. $1,110, yeah, money, for up to 12 months. Non-payment has been less than 10%, so customers are, you know, they're playing by the rules. Fair Money expanded into India in August and has processed more than half a million loan applications there for more than 100,000 unique users since. Fair Money has staff in Lagos, Nigeria, Paris, France, in Latvia, and also hopes to expand engineering into India as well. Other companies in the space include Brazil's New Bank and Nigeria's Paga, which also operates in Ethiopia and also Mexico. Yeah, this is, this is interesting, and it caught my eye because microfinancing has been around for a long time. That's the idea that, that companies make small loans uh, to people who don't have a lot of credit for commercial purposes. But a lot of times people need a loan for a non-commercial purpose or, may, or maybe something that doesn't have all the commercial paperwork that could get microfinancing, but they don't have enough money to open an account with a, an online bank uh, or, or, or a brick and mortar bank, or they, they don't have the credit uh, to open it. 
so so fair money and companies like that are trying to fill in that gap to say, look, you've got a lot of people with feature phones and smartphones who could do banking on their phone. They're using uh, things uh, like Safaricoms uh, uh, and Pesa to, to do transactions. Let's help them bank. Now, the APRs on this are insanely high because of, you know, 10% is still a, a large non-payment rate. Uh, but it's something that doesn't exist otherwise. It's something that can help people, you know, get through some bill payments in, in ways that, that they would face even harsher penalties if, if they couldn't get the loan. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Africa has long been one of the most fascinating tech markets in the world because you see a lot of outside the box uh, uh, kind of solutions for stuff for, for years and years. This is, uh, I think, something that we could probably see on a larger scale even here in 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 America. The idea of these micro, micro, micro loans uh, of considering like in that world, like with that utility, if you think of an immediate loan as less like here's three thousand dollars, but more here's just, a, you know, a way to get through your bill this month. That's an interesting concept. Yeah, their chief product officer uh, at Fair Money came over from Gojek in Indonesia, so so bringing some of that uh, that, that that financial that the ability to do payments and everything into this is definitely something to watch. Uh, Nigeria, Kenya, India, uh, Southeast Asia, the, a lot of interesting things happening in fintech there. What do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is our subreddit. We look at it every day to be like, okay, what's what are, what are, what did our subreddit folks uh, want us to talk about it? So get in there, submit stories, and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. During yesterday's DTNS, Facebook had just started blocking news links from Australian sources worldwide and blocking Australian Facebook users from seeing any news links in anticipation of Australia passing a law that would require Facebook to pay publishers to link to news content, not just for snippets, for any kind of linking. Well, we've learned a little more about what Facebook's doing since then. Facebook used a machine learning model for their blackout. They didn't take the list of companies they would have to negotiate with, they put the AI on it. This meant that fake news and propaganda efforts might not be as likely to escape the block, although a lot of people are still concerned about that. But it also meant several unintended consequences. Australian Facebook users reported the block affected pages for hospitals, fire and emergency services, universities, unions, government departments, the Bureau of Meteorology. You couldn't get the weather report on their Facebook page. Facebook's own page was temporarily affected by the block for a couple hours. Now, why would Facebook apply it so broadly? Well, Facebook said, and I'll quote, as the law does not provide clear guidance on the definition of news content, we have taken a broad definition in order to respect the law as drafted. However, we will reverse any pages that are inadvertently impacted. And they have been doing that. They have been going and cleaning up their mess. Uh, but it's unclear how to get that mess cleaned up. And they're still blocking news, while Google has not blocked news. Google, as we talked about yesterday, signed a deal with most of the biggest Australian publishers, including News Corp, the biggest. Why the different tactic? Well, the economic calculations are different for Google and Facebook. If Google blocked all the news links, other search engines would soon benefit because they don't fall under this law. Only Google to, is targeted by the Australian law. So DuckDuckGo, Bing, et cetera, would just start being like, hey, come here for the news. So it makes sense for Google to reach deals preemptively to avoid third-party arbitration that would definitely benefit the publishers if the law goes into place. Facebook, on the other hand, says news content makes up less than 4% of the content people see in their news feeds. And Facebook sees this as 5.1 billion free referrals that would be worth $407 million if they charged for them like advertising, and it doesn't make a cent off it. So they're betting that people will still read Facebook for baby photos and community reasons, even if they block the news. Now, you may be wondering why Australia is fighting this anyway. Well, the whole point of the bill is to address the decline in publisher income. Nobody's arguing that publishers are making less money than they used to. Advertising money that used to go to publishers now goes to F Google and Facebook, who also, and you can decide whether there's a connection or not, use the publisher's content without paying for it. Publishers have control over this. They can stop their content from being indexed by search with one line in, in a file in the root folder of their website, but they never do. Publishers can stop operating pages on Facebook. 
they could conceivably block referrals from Facebook domains. They could make those links not work themselves. But publishers argue that that's not the point. The market power of Google and Facebook is too strong for those methods to have any effect. It would only hurt themselves and it wouldn't move Google or Facebook. That's one of the reasons Australia has pursued a competition-based law, whereas Europe is going with a copyright-based law. Facebook doesn't mind all making payments. It will pay to include publishers in a special Facebook news section. It's been talking about that in other markets besides Australia. But what it objects to is having to pay for every link that every user posts. So where are we now? Well, uh, Prime Minister Scott, uh, uh, Prime Minister Morrison said the country, quote, would not be intimidated and encouraged Facebook to constructively work with the Australian government, as Google recently demonstrated in good faith. So Australia is like, why can't you be more like your brother Google? Facebook told The Verge, quote, we will continue to engage with the government on amendments to the law with the aim of achieving a stable, fair path for both Facebook and publishers. In other words, all right, we played our card. Now let's talk. Uh, Justin, where do you see this all going? Oh, uh, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. This is something that we've never seen Facebook play hardball like this with a competitor as strong as the country of Australia, a major English-speaking media market, one that is very tied into the global community. Uh, uh, you have uh, you know, a tremendous amount of interconnection, specifically in large, massive uh, advertiser markets like you know, New York and London. Uh, I, I mean, on one hand, Facebook does have a, a, a much more unique problem because you know, for them, they don't just have a section that says, here's the news. Uh, uh, they, their product is based on the news being there. I, uh, man, I, I, I the, the biggest thing that I'm shocked here is culturally that this was a betrayal on a level. It wasn't just a, you know, like, oh, the crazy tech people did the crazy tech thing. It was, oh my God, this thing that I rely on every single day has been ripped away from me. That kind of visceral reaction to me makes me think that Facebook's going to have to think about making a deal that's closer to what the government is, is asking for, if not complying fully. I don't like this law as it is currently being prepared, where you require people to pay for links. Uh, that, that fundamentally breaks the way the web works. The web works, and it has worked since the early 90s, by you get to link to anything on yeah. the internet. The link is never the problem. It's what you write. And so when Europe took the copyright uh, approach, I was like, yeah, you know, there's some issues with it, but that is the right discussion to have. Do I have the right to take snippets? If I do, how much? What's the fair usage of that? But the linking wasn't in question in that. Australia yeah. took it farther. And I, my theory was they took it farther in order, order to push these companies to yield, to come to the table and make you know, some concessions. And it looks like that worked with Google. Google has struck big deals. They've paid more than they would have without this law. And it looks like Australia, as we talked about yesterday, is willing to compromise and say, OK, maybe we won't include search in our enforcement of the rule. Yeah. But I don't like that the rule is still there. And so I like what Facebook is doing in saying, hey, uh, making it illegal to link to stuff looks like this. Let's show you what it looks like. What it also is showing, though, is just how much people have relied on Facebook to be the web. Facebook yeah. shouldn't have yeah. this much power, right? They, it, it, it shouldn't well, that, and that's so many the, things. That is, that's the, our conversation yesterday on DTNS, if you didn't catch our show, I mean, it was, it was a lot of sort of like, huh, Google and Facebook taking very different approaches when it comes to Australia. And, you know, did Google give in too easily? And is this going to be a ripple effect? And that's... A, whole separate conversation but over the last 24 hours since we were talking about this you know a lot of uh organizations that consider themselves news sources saying okay we're not on facebook anymore like what this shouldn't apply to us a lot of users saying no it shouldn't you know this is where i get uh emergency information about a potential wildfire in my area you know i mean australia's got its share of problems it's a big country 
And so there's a, there's a lot of, you know, people saying, well, this is, this is, this, this cannot stand. And Facebook saying, yeah, well, the rules are pretty vague and pretty broad. And this is what it looks like when we're forced to do something like this. Now, if it was any other company besides Facebook, I think Facebook would get a little bit more sympathy or at least empathy when it comes to this, you know, people saying, yeah, it's true. Maybe that law should be written better so that we don't have a situation like this because Facebook's not exactly doing anything wrong. They're doing what they have to do, right? But again, it's Facebook. Facebook is untrustworthy to a large swath of the internet already. That said, people get information from Facebook and there are a lot of organizations who say, yeah, sure, we have another presence somewhere, but that's not how people are accessing our information and you are being unsafe by by effectively turning off all these light switches. Yeah, I mean, here, here's here's the reality politically. Right, and this isn't—I I don't know the Australian uh, political scene enough to make a a specific judgment. But in general, when you make moves like this, and and let's use an allegory of of what Uber did as they were expanding, they would expand into a market. the The city council would say you need to stop doing that. They would yank their service, so you would get an outcry. What you're hoping is the people rush to your defense and say. No, 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 no. We like the tech. We like the tech. Mean government. Stop being so mean to this technology. I don't think, and this surprised me because it, it usually is fairly reliable that that the tech can get, you know, the, the thing that you're interacting with free or little cost will get the benefit of the doubt over the government. People don't, in general, like government. But this has been visceral. This has been way more, and, and Facebook wanted to make a mess of this. They wanted to make it be as ugly as possible. They wanted as much of Australia to be deleted as as uh, uh, possible. And uh, uh, the reaction to it, I think, is fascinating, not just for this, but going forward, because we're going to see a lot of situations like this in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, I, I don't expect Facebook to blink uh, either. Uh, this could this could drag out and it could spread to other markets. So that that will be interesting to I, yeah, watch. For, for, for them, they can't say, oh, yeah, cool. We'll, we'll take this deal per link. Of course. Please, everybody, link all you want. Uh, t- drinks are on mark. Yeah. Like, well, and it, that's that's why I think it's going to drag out, because I don't, I don't see Australia giving them anything that they'll find acceptable. Yeah. The only thing is when you have some of these publishers that then start to look at a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, absent Facebook traffic, that they might be saying to their advertisers, the, oh, wait a minute, these clicks aren't coming through. Now you're going to have a, a larger conversation amongst very high-level parties. Indeed. Uh, well, moving on, friends. Every week on the Snob OS podcast, Nika Montfort has been highlighting engineers, scientists, and entrepreneurs from the black community who are making significant contributions to technology. Nika calls it teching while black. And she was kind enough to give us permission to share an excerpt for you. Here it is. So this week's teching while black is Lisa Jalobter. She is the current CEO and co-founder of a tech-enabled platform called Tech Equitable. Um, which uses tech to um, create a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive um, tech ecosystem. Um, But she is um, a well-known computer scientist, and she got into the computer science game. I think she's been um, in this tech space for over 25 years. She um, cultivated the ascent of online video. And she is the mastermind and brains behind software that we use um, in products such as Hulu and Shockwave. And basically, this technology that was created by her back in 1995 has pretty much led to um, the development of pretty much all of the interactive media that we use now, including web animation and um, video games. Additionally, she developed the animation behind um, being able to create uh, GIFs. Okay. So because you can go and select all your GIFs and, and make your funnies and improve your tweets and add a little flair to it, you have this lady, Lisa Jalobiter, to thank for that. So she is our honoree in this week's Teching While Black. 
That is awesome. Uh, thank you, Nika, uh, for for letting us know about that. And let us uh, excerpt that from the Stab OS podcast. We're going to see if we can get Nika to, to do some more of these uh, for us. For more discussion on that and all things Apple, plus more teching Wild Black segments all month long, check out snoboscast.com. Well, YouTube user Revideo has remastered a 4K 60 frames per second version of Rick Astley's 1987 pop hit, Never Gonna Give You Up. Now, you might remember bouncing along to that song back in 87, but you might also remember it perhaps better in 2017 when it had a resurgence in the form of what is now known as the Rick Roll. Is this something that we need? Do we want Never Gonna Give You Up in 4K? Maybe not but it might be something you want to bookmark for a rainy day prank. A little background, by the way. If you've forgotten on how that whole Web 2.0 era Rick Rowling trend started, I had to look it up because I didn't remember how it started either. Back in March of 2007, the first trailer for Grand Theft Auto 4 was posted on Rockstar Games' website, but so many people were super excited and they tried to watch it and they crashed Rockstar's site. So, as they are want to do several users posted mirrors of the video saying yeah, you can watch it here one of which was a user on 4chan who promised the gta trailer but instead linked to the never going to give you up video and thus rick rowling was born uh <laughs> it looks so good in 4k i actually put it up uh side by side with the 1080p version on my monitor muted uh, in order to to compare the video, and it really does look better. It, it, he Rick actually looks good upscaled. He does, he does, and and uh, uh, it it like things often do in uh, sixty frames per second. It looks more like a home video than the uh, what what you would. <laughs> you know. Imagine it a professional video looks like, and Ashley looks so much younger. I mean, I guess you you get a, a truer sense of. Uh, you know, how young he was when he shot that video because you don't have the video artifacting that kind of cements it in your uh -huh. mind as a, right. late, a late 80s uh, piece of art. Yeah, a little motion smoothing effect, but otherwise it looked really good. All right, let's check out the yeah. mailbag. So Russell wrote in about our conversation with Allison Sheridan on Tuesday's show about the pros and cons of working from home. Russell's in the business of workplace design. So he says, Don, a Good bit of research on this, especially over the last year. We also had looked at this with our clients before the pandemic. Few things to consider, Russell says. When you work day to day with people in an office, you build up social capital with your teams through interactions that aren't necessarily fully related to the job. Over the past year, some teams that have been separated and working from home have burned through what was built up over time without replenishing it. Also, newer, younger employees that have not had the benefit of the spontaneous interaction with coworkers that can foster learning and cultural integration. Russell goes on to say, working from home seems proven to work in the short term for most businesses, but they haven't had the time to go through a full innovation cycle and understand the effects that separation can have on creativity and development of new ideas over time. Before the pandemic, there were a number of companies that experimented with remote workforces, and for the most part, the outcomes weren't favorable to the business overall. Russell ends with saying, thank you for keeping DTNS running through all of this crazy. I enjoy it every weekend as I walk the streets of an ever-improving and more hopeful New York City. Ah, uh, good insights. Thank you, Russell. Yeah, absolutely. Also, thank you to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today they include Pat Sheeran, John Atwood, and Daniel Dorado. Big, big thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today. Justin, you're back in the old CA state. I am, yes. The old I don't know CA why I said it that way. That, 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 that <laughs> uh, uh, classic <laughs> reference to, uh, to California. <laughs> Uh, uh, I am, I am uh, back in Oakland, and uh, of course, all my thoughts are with uh, everybody in in Texas, Austin, Dallas, Houston, and all all stops in between with all their power issues that they have. Uh, we're uh, talking about uh, so much though on the politics, politics, politics podcast, including a a look into a resetting of our political expectations past COVID, and on tomorrow's episode, Friday's episode, we talk a lot about super PACs and specifically. Uh, the Lincoln Project, which is something that I've got a lot of very, very, very strong opinions about. Oh, I cannot wait to hear that. I'm intrigued. 
Uh, hey, folks, uh, if you need a little more explanation on big tech topics like Wi-Fi 6 or 5G or Patreon, are you one of those people who's like, why do people like Tom use Patreon? Don't they just rip him off? Well, this week's episode of Know a Little More explains Patreon and how it works and how it benefits creators, what it takes, what it doesn't, how it compares to other creator revenue sharing things like Twitch and YouTube. Uh, if you want to know how Patreon works, as well as lots of other stuff in the back episode, Episodes, check out our related show, Know a Little More. You can know a little more about all that and more at knowalittlemore.com. We are live Monday through Friday. That's at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more. Tell a friend, bookmark it, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>